Benny, I'm so excited about our guest today. Let's go. Our guest today left a profitable life as a nonprofit executive to start her own coaching and leadership company. Please welcome confidence coach and leadership consultant, Margie DuBois. <laughs> What's up, Margie? Hey, Ryan. How's it going? <laughs> Great to have you here. Great to have you here. Love Aww, it. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I wanted you to be on this podcast because you talk about something that I must admit, even until you said it, I hadn't really thought about it in my own life. What does courage mean to you? Yeah, that's such a great question. So courage is ultimately a willingness to live your best life. And sometimes that involves pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone, but you're ultimately showing up with authenticity. And that takes a lot of confidence and courage to do. And confidence is ultimately about the beliefs you have about yourself. So when we upgrade our beliefs, we're able to show up with more confidence. And we do that by practicing courage. Let's talk about your courage journey, your confidence journey. I mean, you're leaving a successful career in nonprofits. Talk about leaving that and starting your own business and, and working for yourself. Sure. So I was hired at the age of 24 years old to be an executive director of a national low-income housing agency called Rebuilding Together. And that really was the catalyst to my courage journey, right? Having to push myself into a leadership role when I had no idea what I was doing. And I led that organization for seven years. And then I moved to Denver, where I was the director of Reading Partners, which is a national children's literacy organization. And towards the end of my time there, I realized that I was feeling a little stuck in my career and I was wanting something different. And ultimately, I decided I wanted to open up my own business. So I pursued my coaching certification, knew I liked that. And then I also knew that I wanted to work with teams and helping people become better leaders. So I launched my business in March of 2020. It was oh, not no. supposed oh, to be. No. Yeah, oh, no. that was not supposed to be when it was, but it happened. And I'm so glad that I took that leap of faith and leap of courage because it's been amazing and I love what I do. Go ahead. No, you go. Go ahead. I was going to ask you, where did you get your coaching certification? Yeah. Um, yeah and what did you really learn during that time? Because coaching is a, a different way of life, asking questions, being present. It's not, hey, here's the answer. It's how do you see this? Thank you so much for saying that. A lot of people think that coaching is hiring someone to tell you what to do. It's the opposite. Good coaches and certified coaches know how to ask you empowering questions that take your life to the next level. I got my coaching certification with IPEC, which is a really outstanding program. We have lots and lots of training hours, and I'm so glad I went through that program. And to answer your earlier question, it was really hard. Hmm. When you learn how to coach, it's completely the opposite of how you've probably been leading before. Yeah. You're learning how to become an active listener. You're not listening to respond. You're listening to be curious. You're listening to ask people open-ended questions so that they can answer questions on their own and be, you know, the driver of their own lives. I like to say your coach is like your loyal passenger on a road trip. You're in the driver's seat and your hands are on the steering wheel, but your coach is like this passenger that's helping you get from point A to point B. Yeah, I we love need, that. We yeah. need you to talk to some of our former coaches because <laughs> yeah. they were driving the bus. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, yeah. But I, yeah. I want to go back to a moment. You said March 2020. I remember talking with you, and it was like one day you just said, "I'm going to start my own coaching firm, and I'm going to I'm going to have my own clients." And what I what what struck me was how confident you were, even though there were no answers. How did you do that? How can you how teach our listeners? How did you in that moment? You said, "I know this is what I want to do." I don't have a single client yet, but it's going to happen. And it has now. Now you, you you literally can't take on more clients. How did you manage that time between launching and landing your company? Yeah, so great question. So I, at the time, was seeing a therapist who I still see, see today. I think everyone should have a counselor. And I was wrestling with this decision. And he looked at me one day. He never really speaks up. And he goes, Margie, you've never taken a risk your whole life. Ooh. And I was like, excuse me? Whoa. Excuse me? I was like, I moved to Denver. I led reading partners. I did all these things. And he goes, yeah, but you know you'd be good at that and you'd like it. You're taking a huge risk. And that's why you're having such a hard time taking the leap. 
you're going to have to take a leap even if you don't know what the outcome's going to be. Wow. And that day changed my life. And I decided, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to like this. I don't know how successful I'm going to be, but I won't know unless I try. And so I knew I had to do it. Going back to that moment yeah. where your therapist calls you out right there, mm-hmm. you respond to it. So now you've been doing this for three years. Mm-hmm. What would you tell yourself back then in terms of how to build the business? So you've built it, mm-hmm. you're taking on clients. Is there something that you could have yes. done earlier or sooner or you know, you know, early on in that journey of, of building mm-hmm. the business? Such a good question. So I think two things. One is when you go on the journey of entrepreneurship, there's a lot of noise around you, a lot of social media, influencers, people telling you how your business should look, what you should do, best practices. Everybody has to have this website. Everybody has to have this brand. And it's really hard to filter the noise and listen to yourself and your own intuition and your own heart. And so for me, I felt a lot of pressure at the beginning of my journey to niche myself and know exactly who I work with and build this perfect formula of what I do. And I chose to not listen to the noise and just try. Use the first couple years as experimentation to have fun and say yes, like Shonda Rhimes, a year of yes. Say yes to everything, right? And then after that, I began that process of narrowing and really, you know, boiling it down to what I wanted to do. And I'm glad that I honored that. But it was hard because I felt like I wasn't doing it right, you know, and that was really hard for me. I think the second thing I wish I would have spent more time on is getting really clear on my zone of genius. Uh, The author Gay Hendricks in The Big Leap talks about your zone of genius. And that's the work you're uniquely suited to do. It's the work where time just never runs out and you feel like it's effortless and fun. I wish I had taken more time to go inward and really figure out what that is. And now I know what that is, but instead I spent a lot of time playing in what's called my zone of competence, the things I know how to do, Mm. but they're not really my zone of genius and my greatest gifts. That's super interesting. I think because I should have had you as a coach when I, (laughs) when I started launching my coaching career, because I got sucked into all of the noise. You got it. You have to have your target market. You got to have your funnel built. What's your high ticket offer? What's your low ticket offer? You got to start a course. You should do this. You should do that. And I spent so much money on getting nothing, no clients. Um, so shout out to you for like listening to yourself and that intuition. I would like to double click on the zone of genius part though, mm-hmm. because I think that's something we all could do better. And that just struck a chord with me. It's like, okay, what is that zone of genius? And really diving deep into that, where you do, where, where you wake up every day and it's like, oh, this is incredible. I think you said you're doing it. The only other person I've seen do it at the highest level is the Manning family. Mm. They never look like they're working. They're working all the time, but they never look like it. They're on TV and all they're doing is talking about football. Mm. They do commercials with their dad and their other brother. They go to football camps. They go to practices. They, they get consulting on football jobs. They're just they're zone of genius. So talk a little bit about that for you. Yeah. So the zone of genius, as I said earlier, is really the work you're uniquely suited to do. It feels effortless. It doesn't feel like work. When you're in the zone, maybe Ryan's having conversations like this. This relates to Ryan's zone of genius. Probably same for you too, right? It's effortless. It's free-flowing. It's fun. It doesn't feel stressful. It doesn't feel heavy, right? And it ties delicately with your strengths, right? So I'm a big fan of strengths-based leadership, and I use Clifton and Gallup's strengths-based evidence to all the work I do with my clients. And when we're living into our strengths and our zone of genius, we're able to not only enjoy our jobs more, but we make a bigger impact. Mm -hmm. So with the Manning family, football is like the medium or the how to which he's living out his zone of genius, but there's something in there that ties it in for them. Maybe it's making the community better uh, through football and community, right? Maybe that's related to it, but it's really going inward. And a lot of us aren't taught how to do that. We all follow the same academic system and we just get put in a box and told like a bunch of minions to go and do work. And that's just not what it is. And so I'm so passionate about helping leaders and individuals really know their strengths and make sure they're in the right role. Can we dive into? I'm sorry. No, that, do yeah. do. Can we dive into that even more in terms of? Okay, we get put in this box. Mm-hmm. School it teaches yeah. you to do this. Got to go to college. How do you feel about the education system, and how do you think people should go about 
you know, getting educated. Obviously, there, I think there are certain things that have to be required, but how do you think about education now, knowing what you know? That is, we could talk about that question for probably a whole day, right? <laughs> um, and I have a Sorry. lot of thoughts on the education system. I was the executive director of Reading Partners for five years, so I really got exposure early, K-4, you know, what's going on for kids. And, which, which tell people why it's yeah. important for kids to learn <laughs> yeah. to read. Tell me yeah. the impact. So yeah. if a kid is reading at grade level, by the time they reach fourth grade or start fourth grade, they're four times more likely to graduate from high school on time. Literacy, I would say, is a child's biggest driver of their lifelong success and opportunities mm. over anything that we could invest in, right? Mm -hmm. So it's super, super important. Um, but going into the education piece, if I have kind of one bucket list that I haven't stated and shared with anybody, it's starting a new school someday later down the road that sets up kids for life, not for test taking, right? Mm -hmm. And so many skills that Ryan and I are passionate about. I specialize in interpersonal communication. Ryan's passionate about financial literacy. Mm -hmm. How often do you learn that at all? Zero. Zero. You <laughs> never learn those things in school. Emotional intelligence, how to solve problems, how to interview, right? Yeah. How, how to, to manage a budget, how to dress professionally, whatever you're doing. We never teach kids those lifelong skills. And so I think our education system needs complete reform. Um, and I think we need to teach Teach treater, uh, teachers and educators better. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to go back yeah. to something because as your friend, as someone who knows you, I was shocked to hear something you said. How come you never took a risk before launching your business? What prevented you from taking a risk? Ryan, that's a really bold question, and I love it. <laughs> um, I think it probably is that as somebody who's always been an achiever and a I learned a recovering perfectionist. I always made decisions based on, will I be good at this and will I do a good job? Hmm. Like, will people approve of me if I do this? Will my parents approve of me? Will I get social approval if I do this, right? So I've always ultimately, I've worked really hard, but I've always picked paths and opportunities that I knew I could do pretty well, hmm. right? So when you open your own business at the beginning of a pandemic, <laughs> you know, it's an interesting life decision, um, but I didn't know if I'd like it. To be honest, my biggest fear was would I feel isolation? Would I not enjoy the work? Because I was so used to working on big teams where I was leading people. It's a very different model being in the background. And so I've learned sometimes we so want that perfect box of roadmap that's with a bow tie on the top of it. And that's just not an option always in our life. Sometimes we have to say yes, even if we don't know what the outcome's going to be. I love that because in football, we we start a drive. You can't know yeah. you're going to score a touchdown. You still yeah. got to go. And so for me, it's always foreign. You know, one of the things about taking risks is like you have to take risks. Mm -hmm. So it's shocking that, you know, you hadn't done it. But what was it that made you say, I'm going to take this risk? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to, or what was the feeling when you did take the mm -hmm. risk? Like, did you feel like you were falling in an elevator? Did you yeah. feel like you had a paper cut? Were you nervous? Were she your armpits sweaty? Out. Were you know, palms mm -hmm. heavy? Were you, you know, m, &M. and yeah. what, was, what was the feeling when you took your first risk? Yeah. So I'd say what led me to the yes was the whispers. You know, Oprah always says, listen to those whispers. And I always felt like it wasn't a no. It always was a yes. It was a, I'm scared, yes, but it was a yes. So I had to listen to those whispers. And then once I took that leap, I just felt so much lighter. Mm. I was so bogged down and burnt out with nonprofit leadership. And even though I was so passionate about the work I was doing, I knew I needed a change for my mental health, my physical health, my emotional health. I just needed a change. And so once I took that step, it was like, okay, this isn't as bad as I thought. My supervisor at the time was so amazing. And she goes, I'm bummed out, but I am so excited for you. Mm. Like, let's create a pathway forward. And that moment with her was huge because I knew I had her backing and I didn't feel like I was letting someone down. It's awesome to see that support when you get that yeah. support, when you're taking mm -hmm. a leap and then you have those people who yeah. encourage you like to live out that true authentic self. I think mm -hmm. that's incredible. I want to dive into your coaching. Yes. And I want to talk about the themes that you're seeing in leadership mm -hmm. and like where you're seeing the biggest gaps in clients or mm -hmm. just in general. When people reach out to you, mm -hmm. what is it about? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's a good question. People reach out to me about all sorts of things, but the main theme is 
either an individual is lacking confidence or not engaging with others at work in a way that's as productive, or it's, hey, our team just isn't gelling right now. Like we really don't know quite what our culture is, our values, we don't know what they are. We really need clarity on how we work together. And so my role as a coach and a leadership consultant is helping people answer those big questions, but more importantly, give them the training and resources they need to show up at their full self and their highest potential so that they can make a bigger impact together. I had I had imposter syndrome when I got into coaching. I was like, I mean, people have this already figured out <clears throat> just because, you know, I'm coming from professional sports. Mm-hmm. But then I had to, like, take a look back and be like, well, I only won one Super Bowl, so yeah. nobody has it all figured out. Uh, I think that's incredible in terms of, you know, the values are on the website, but people aren't necessarily living them out or the teams aren't living them out. Like, how do you help them live it out? How do you help them, like, call it out and, yeah. and work together? Yeah, great question. So uh, one thing I'm really passionate about is interpersonal communication. And most of us are never taught how to do it. What does it mean? So how do you communicate with people when you're giving feedback, when there's you're in conflict with them, when there's a challenge, when you want to give people praise, when you want to tell something they're doing good, we're not really taught how to do that. Most people are not actually taught how to manage and lead others either. Some companies, even large companies, have, oh, we'll put you through your HR onboarding, and then we're going to put you through this you know, two-week training, and then now you're done. You know how to be a manager. Being a great leader and manager of people takes years to become an expert at, right? And so it's really important to have objective people supporting your team at work to help you give help you get those skills you need to be successful. Yeah. Will you sit in on board meetings and, yep. and watch that communication? Because yep. I think it's unique when a leader, you you come to a leader, you're talking with a leader, and they're mm-hmm. like, this is what I need to work on. And then you go to a meeting, and you're like, that's not what you need to work on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sometimes I will sit on meetings, whether it's with a C-suite, or I will do a partner meeting with a manager and a supervisor, or I will attend a nonprofit board meeting and observe the group together interacting with each other. But I like to be careful that I don't judge people for how they're showing up, but instead I ask them, how do you think you're showing up? Mm -hmm. Tell me about when you feel the most stress at work, what's going on, and we kind of get to the root of the issue. I'll also do 360 facilitation, so feedback facilitation, which is so powerful. A lot of times we just do performance reviews and they're not really meaningful and employees don't get valuable feedback, but when you ask a team of 10 people to give you really specific feedback on how you're showing up, it unlocks so much opportunity. Mm. Let's just tackle a couple of the things. I mean, I'm glad you brought up imposter syndrome. We've all had that. I'm glad you shared it. I had that the night before the Super Bowl. I still can see myself standing in my room <laughs> after night meetings like, what am I doing here? Like, this, <laughs> I'm a kid from St. Paul. What is happening right now? How do people get through imposter syndrome? What are, ta- what are tactical tools that you can give us, Margie, to get through imposter syndrome? Ryan, that is like a loaded million dollar question, but I will I will give my best. So I think it's all about building confidence and confidence in my own words is the amount of love and trust you have for yourself. Mm. If you learn how to love yourself, trust yourself and really fully understand who you are, what you value and what your gifts are in this world, then your confidence just gets higher and higher and higher. People think that confidence is about ego. It's not. It's the opposite. Really arrogant leaders, we all know them. Those are not confident leaders. Those are actually very insecure leaders. So confidence is this innate knowing and grounding so that when imposter syndrome sets in, you're able to stop and say, you know what? I'm feeling really triggered and nervous right now. What's going on for me? And you practice self-compassion, which also involves knowing your common humanity with others. I bet both of you felt nervous before before the Super Bowl, right? Yeah, I'm everybody on your team, yeah, everybody right on your team felt nervous. It's totally normal to feel that way. And then it is asking yourself, what is a new belief I could try on right in this moment? Right? Byron Katie, a uh, famous author and leader, she says, "Who would I be without this belief?" So if you didn't have that nervous belief or that imposter syndrome, how might you show up? Or nervousness, you can still yeah. be great with nervousness. Right. You know, that yeah. was something for me. So it's not necessarily yeah. what does it, how do you want to be without it? But if it's telling you to be this way, you can change that. That's what you're saying. Yep. 
Absolutely. And it's it's trying on new beliefs. I always like to say, <laughs> like, it's like trying on new clothes. You go and you try on the jacket, you look at them and you're like, okay, kind of like this one. Or maybe you don't. I'm not asking you to believe in the thing you're saying. I'm asking you to try it on. And Brian, and, you know, in my work, um, Ryan and I talk about, you know, the power of I am and mindset, right? We can yeah. actually rewire our brains and help us think differently about the beliefs we have about ourselves. But we have to practice. I love that. It's just yeah. the Mike Tomlinism. Oh, dude! It, sometimes there just is no secret. You have to do the work, and you have to you no. have to have that compassion. But mm-hmm. it 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 is a super small thing, and everybody always thinks it's mm-hmm. got to be this huge thing, or I got to I have to do this, yep. and it's going to get me there. But it's really just these little small moments. It is, and sometimes people who I see struggle with imposter syndrome the most sometimes haven't taken the time to really discover their values and who they are Mm. because they're living a life for other people, not for themselves. They haven't really discovered what matters to me, what are my strengths that I want to offer this world, and what is a career path that lights me on fire, that brings my heart so much joy. And so, you know, it's a really, really important, you know, when I do coaching, um, career pivots happens a lot. Because Mm. I think sometimes people come to me when they're burnt out and they're not living a life or career on purpose. And then our work together is ultimately, how do I get back on track? And then they change and then they change their whole career. Sometimes. Or they might. I once had a client. um, She was an attorney at a law firm. And she realized, you know what? I think I still want to be an attorney, but I want to work in the government and help people who are struggling in the criminal justice system. Right. Mm. So it might be just a pivot of what you're doing. You also work with people and leaders who struggle with communication, right? People come to you, they say, I'm not able to communicate to my team or my teammates. What are some things to think about if you're a leader or if you're a part of a team and you want to communicate? What are some key communication tools? Yeah, such a great question, Ryan. So I'd say there's about four or five things I usually go over with teams when we do communication training, but I'll name a few uh, to think about today. So the first is the power of validation. So validation is essentially letting someone know that you hear them. You're validating their experience. You're maybe extending empathy. Something that we confuse about validation is it does not mean you're agreeing with the other person. Mm. So let's say I always use the analogy of if you have kids, a toddler is having a meltdown at a playground because they want to go, they want to go, you need to go home. And the toddler is really upset. It's not about arguing whether or not it's time for dinner or whether or not they're being rational. It's saying, I know how bummed you are. You want, you love playing with your friends at the playground. We, but we got to go. So let's go, right? So validation is a powerful tool because the second you validate someone, it lowers their temperature and Mm. they are going to be able to have the tough conversation with you, right? Are are there some key phrases like, I I understand what you're saying or I can see that? Mm -hmm. What are some key phrases? Yeah. So you actually, iPad coaching teaches you don't want to use the word I because ultimately it puts the focus back on you even if you're not intending to do that. So you'll want to say it makes complete sense that you'd feel so bummed out that this keynote didn't go as well as you wanted. You work so hard, Ryan, to be a great speaker and you care about excellence in the work you do. And it makes complete sense you're feeling bummed out right now. Mm-hmm. It's very different than talking about yourself. Right. We're getting yeah. coached right now. Yeah. Hey, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm better for it. I'm <laughs> yeah. better for it. Yeah. We're getting coached yeah. right now. Yeah. So another is acknowledgement, where you're essentially paraphrasing back to the other person what they said to you. So that can look like, let me make sure if I got this right. What you're telling me is you went to meet with this employee to share with them about the presentation and you started arguing and you left the conversation feeling frustrated and defeated. So you're paraphrasing back to the other person what they said to you. And that really ensures that the other person knows you're listening to them. And then the third thing I would say that's the most powerful is asking open-ended questions. Most of us lead with closed-ended questions. And what that is, is using words like is, did, do, does, where the conversation is going to end with a yes or no answer. Mm -hmm. And it's a dead stop. Mm -hmm. Versus if I said to you, what are three things you think might make you feel better in this situation? Mm -hmm. Or as a manager, how can I support you? It invites more conversation and then allows the other person to get to where they need to go. Wow. Coming from a place of curiosity, you know, I think that's one of the things that I've loved about great leadership or 
leadership books or even experiencing and doing my own leadership coaching is like really getting curious about the person across from you. Um, how do you think you would have benefited from a leadership coach in terms of your nonprofit work? Did you oh have a gosh. coach at that time? <laughs> no, I never had a coach, but I did have really good mentors and outstanding board members who were so supportive of me as a professional and a leader. So I think that's what made the difference. But as soon as I learned how to become a coach, I said, oh my gosh, I've been doing this wrong my entire career, right? <laughs> I have not been asking open-ended questions. I've not been doing enough validation, all of these really c critical skills. But really what it is is the power of knowing yourself and knowing how you show up with others, how you get in your own way, because we have to look inward first and become a better leader of ourselves to become an effective leader of others. And that is, I'd say, out of all the leaders I work with, the biggest tension points is when the leaders of the team are not doing the work. You mm. cannot expect the rest of the team to function and follow in suit if you're not putting in the work yourself. Before we let you go, I want to talk burnout. It's a common word right now. I know how I defeat it, you know, using words like I am, I can, I will, I am burnt out, I can take a break, I can cancel meetings, I will cancel these meetings, and I will take a nap, whatever it is. What are ways that you teach leaders in a corporate setting to overcome burnout? I think the first step is acknowledging that you're burning out and you're getting really honest with your feelings. And at work, we're not taught to do that. We're taught to be strong, keep everything in inside. And for men, it's even tougher in some cases. And so I think that it's really important to acknowledge the grief you're going through in your life, if that's applicable, and talk about a pathway forward for more balance. And so, you know, burnout is is used a lot and we have to look at it through a kind of a whole 360 view, right? You got to look at the individual, their leader and the environment, the organization and figure out what steps you need to take to change the burnout factor. Mm. Yeah. And just to finish off and really appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Uh, where and can, coaching us. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> but number one, where can people find you? Yeah. And then I have one more question. Sure. So you can, my Instagram handle is Coach Margie, pretty easy, Coach M-A-R-G-I-E. And then you can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Margie Deboy. And then my company is The Thrillby Company at thrillbyco.com. And I would love to support you or your team if you're listening today. Awesome. And then my number one question is, what is the one thing that people should take away from this conversation mm. and that you're giving back to them? I would tell you that you are way closer than you think to living your happiest life. Like the power people have to change their lives within just one coaching session or one meeting is powerful. And that if people are willing to do the work, that they can absolutely achieve what they want to do. One of my favorite quotes is by Aeneas Nin, and it says, and then the day came when the risk to blossom was greater than a, oh, I'm botching this. I got to figure this one out. And the day of the game came, I'll, I'll figure it out later. But uh, it was like the risk to blossom was greater than the whisk, risk it took to stay in a bud. And mm. it's like that day you have to decide that you're willing to take the risk to live your best life and you can do it if you put your mind to it. That sounds cliche, but it really is possible. Now your company has quarterly challenges. What's the, leave us with the quarterly challenge from the Thoroughly Cole. Yeah, so in order to make coaching an inclusive opportunity for all people, inc including people who can't afford coaching, at least privately, my company hosts a quarterly challenge. And each quarter we focus on an area that aligns with our company values and mission statement. So this year we kick things off with the kindness challenge, practicing kindness towards others and ourselves for a whole week. And then we just wrapped up the fun challenge, which was practicing playfulness and fun and joy in your life, with, which actually most people are not good at doing. Mm. Um, and then this fall we're doing the mindfulness challenge. And it's kind of a social social media phone detox opportunity to go inward and practice mindfulness and getting in touch with yourself. So it's a lot of fun. It's only seven days. It's free and you can sign up anytime. Thanks so much for joining us, Mark. You're welcome. You're a legend. Appreciate you. Sorry, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.